and good morning. And this morning we are honoring the 4th of July weekend. And so I'd like to call um, our flag bearers to come down front and center. And they would be Ray Belisle and Richard Foster, who are both retired uh, from the U.S. Army. Uh, both served in Vietnam. And also we have current duty Eric DeBrinzi, who is in the Air Force Reserve and also works at Westover. Uh, so for those of you uh, who need, it is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and the Star Spangled Banner are on your song sheet, uh, but hopefully you don't even need to look. So we'll begin now with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Jimmy, that you used a few years ago? It was from uh, W.C. Fields. I, I, uh, I quoted W.C. Fields when, upon, on his deathbed, a visitor, a friend visited him, and W.C. Fields was reading the Bible, and he said, W.C., you can't, 10 years old goose, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm surprised to see you reading the Bible. And he said, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's no, I still remember that day four years ago, and there's Dave Moskin with him as well, and uh, Dave is our treasurer right next to our secretary. Jimmy's the past master, and I just was with Jimmy on Friday. He never said a word about him coming today. Um, so we do welcome you here today uh, as we anticipate the 4th of July. Uh, so this is our second Mass of today. There were some people that were a little bit smarter than you. They came in, it was cool. Um, there was no sermon, there was no singing, there was none of this. And so we were out of church in just over a half an hour. So uh, I think they really enjoyed that. But uh, 7.45 without music and everything, it, it's just not the same to me. So um, we will skip the, uh, the introductory hymn and move right into Mass. And so uh, for our guests, we will be starting right on page 39 of the book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, on the bottom of 
page 40. Lord, bless us with the wisdom to praise you in spirit and in truth, so that by following your holy will, we may gain eternal salvation. Amen. So as mentioned, I do welcome you here for this Independence Day weekend marriage. Uh, some of the guys from our men's club from the parish are heading down to a heart trip this evening at 6.30 to watch the Yard Goats play the Red Sox farm team, the Portland Sea Dogs. Uh, looking forward to that this evening. Uh, that's really Americana. It's going to be a lot of fun on this weekend. I do hope that all of you have uh, some plans for the 4th of July, and I hope maybe you want to come back on 4th of July. We'll be having Mass here at 8 o'clock on our actual 241st 41st birthday of our nation. And, uh, you know, for people who came from other lands where there wasn't freedom, our founders of this church, uh, when they came here, they took things that we can sometimes take for granted. They appreciated them dearly. They treated the 4th of July not only as a patriotic um, holiday, but as really a religious holy day. And really, when you know you think about our founders and all of the, the, the rights and the liberties that they have given to us, they didn't base it on you know human rights, they didn't base it on the government, they based it on God's given qualities that all of us are created in His image, all of us are born free. And so there is that kind of the sacred and this idea that every person matters, and that we're not just here to make the state more powerful, Every person matters, and I think we celebrate that as part of our church tradition, and I hope you'll keep that in mind throughout this weekend. So as we do gather, though, for the second Mass of this Independence Day weekend, I ask you to please make a private examination of conscience in preparation for communion. Father, you welcome all who come to you in sincerity of heart. Help 
help us never to doubt your tenderness, but rather to entrust ourselves to your mercy and to walk humbly with each other. We ask you for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The lesson for today's Holy Mass is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. <clears throat> Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, God. If you do good, know for whom you are doing it, and your kindness will have its effect. Do good to the just person, and reward will be yours, if not from him, from the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Like clay in the hands of a potter, be molded in the hands of his pleasure, so are people in the hands of their creator, to be assigned by him their function. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, you cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. In your mercy, cleanse me so I may worthy proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthy proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will, treat, will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is righteous will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Until 50 years later, right smack in the middle of World War II. 
Now its message of union and of universal liberty and justice defined as an opposition to the Nazis, to the Imperial Japanese. We were fighting not only against our enemies, we were fighting for who we were, and that was reflected in the Pledge of Allegiance. The same thing happened 12 years later, when we are now engaged in the Cold War. We are fighting the Communist North Koreans and the Communist Chinese directly and the Communist Russians indirectly. And communism, as you probably all know, was officially atheistic. Their system worked openly against religion and the religious. So in 1954, that President Dwight D. Eisenhower is urging that Congress legislated that that little phrase, under God, be added to the Pledge of Allegiance, and it became the one that we just recited now, the one that I learned in elementary school, the one probably they are still learning in elementary school. So once again, we weren't only fighting against somebody else, we were fighting for our way of life. And in 1954, every family, whether they belonged to a Jewish synagogue or to a Christian church, they went somewhere in 1954. Religion was part of who we were. So traditions that may seem to be unchanging, they be just that. They may only seem to be unchanging. Traditions actually require change to, be, to remain vibrant and meaningful. Take, for example, Jefferson's solemn words in the Declaration of Independence that we remember this weekend. There it is written, all men are created equal. Now that is famous. That is a compelling statement of our history and who we are. And we can and we should be proud of all people are created equal. But to stay true to that message that is enshrined in our Declaration of Independence, we had to change its meaning. I once saw with Sharon, I think we were still only dating at the time, we went down to Washington, D.C., and I saw an actual copy of the Declaration of Independence. It's kept in a secure lock case in some inert gas so that, that document can stay unchanged for as long as is humanly possible. And it's protected within this fortress-like National Archives building in Washington. Now, the words of that document, they may not change, like we have changed the words of the Pledge of Allegiance, but we had to change the meaning of that document. Jefferson didn't really mean all men. He was a slaveholder. In fact, he impregnated one of his slaves and wouldn't even admit to that that they were his children. So he didn't mean all men when he said all men. Even 13 years later, when our Constitution was first accepted, American Indians didn't count at all, and slaves were only counted as three-fifths of a person, and only as three-fifths of a person so that those Southerners could have more representatives in Congress so that they could make sure that slavery stayed in place. It wasn't to grant the slaves three-fifths of a vote. So it would take a civil war to get a better meaning of what all created or all people are equal means. And it wouldn't be until the 19th Amendment in 1919 which, by the way, is after our church was already allowing women to be on the parish committee, to be on national organization. 1919, our, our country finally said that all men are created equal finally comes to mean all mankind, or maybe a better word, all humankind, that all men and women are created equal. So to stay true to those thoughts that are written down and unchanging and saved in that inert gas in that fortress-like building, the words haven't changed, but the meaning has, and thank God that the meaning has. We don't want to go back to where only white men are what all men are created equal means. So it probably won't happen for about another 10 years. Who knows where politics are? Maybe it'll never happen. But the United States Treasury last year decided to replace President Andrew Jackson's image on the $20 bill, and instead they're going to put Harriet Tubman there. Now, Eric, I'm sorry, Andrew Jackson, he owned about 150 people. And he wasn't a nice slave owner. He kept them absolutely illiterate on his plantation in Tennessee because he figured a little bit of intelligence is very dangerous if you want to keep them on the plantation. So Harriet Tubman was herself a slave. She fought against that peculiar institution of ours, as they said back then, and she even served as a Union spy during the Civil War. So change can be slow. You know, we're talking 150 plus years now, and it's not always steady. You can sometimes move forward and then take a couple steps back, and it is seldom, if ever, smooth. But change is necessary. You know, at the time that Jackson was president, a nobleman and a scholar came over here from France by the name of Alex de Tocqueville, and he came to investigate American democracy for himself to see what this was all about. And one of his insights that he recorded was, the greatness of America 
lies not in her being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. We make mistakes, but we don't have to stick with them. Can you imagine if we could go back in time to 150 years ago and tell our fellow citizens back then that the portrait of their president that owned 150 people was going to be taken off of our currency and replaced by a slave and a female slave on top of that, it would be unimaginable to them. Now, change is not always predictable. It's going to be exciting in some ways, but I would hate to imagine what would happen without it. Without it, we wouldn't be able to correct our faults. So change is necessary to maintain the ideals of the tradition. America is built upon the power of change. Our ability and our willingness to adapt has allowed us to reinvent ourselves as Americans time and time again, and hopefully still more in the future. We were once all white Protestants. There was an actual holiday in colonial Massachusetts whose purpose was only to mock Catholics. They would march down the streets of Boston, and they would have the Pope in effigy, and they would burn him, and they would tar and feather him. But we adapted, and we became the better for it. We changed. The immigrants who founded this church of ours realized that only in this nation, in a kind of country like this, could we ever hope to build a people's Catholic church. Because where they were, as soon as they tried to do something like this, it would have been stamped out immediately. So when the delegates gathered at our special synod in 1906, we weren't even 10 years old yet, Father Hoder said these words as he prepared to swear in the delegates who had gathered to help define who we would be as church. And he said to them, what power is it that has brought us here, honored brothers and beloved in Christ? What idea has led us to this holy place and before this altar sacrifice? The idea of a free church. Of all the things he could have said, Hoder said that what brought us together is the idea of a free church. We were also mocked for this innovation of trying to have Catholic and democracy all together, but we adapted and were the better off for it. You know, Albert Einstein, who I love, I got his picture in my office, he once said, the American lives even more for his goals, for the future, than anybody else. Life for him is always about becoming, not just being. Change is a part of who we are. Our faith also calls upon us to do the exact same thing. When baptized, as Paul today, we die to our old selves just as Jesus died on the cross so that we can resurrect, quote, dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Once we are baptized, we are supposed to be different people. Change is expected of us as Christians, and change is also expected of us as Americans. So may our prayer on our 241st birthday of this nation of ours, maybe that we change in our nation, and that the changes in our nation, that they walk hand in hand with the changes that Jesus expects of us as Christians. So that under God is not only a phrase that we add because of communism, that under God and all the religious talk is not only used by politicians, but that under God really means that we try to live as citizens and as people of faith, more like God would have us, where we care about each other, where we take care of each other, and where as much as we have to go to war, so I appreciate all the service of these men here that came forward and all the others that are serving right now. I can't even imagine, last night I was watching the news, and our American forces are right in Mosul fighting ISIS. I mean, these are savages. ISIS are savages. We've got Americans there, and we don't even know about it hardly. It's not in our front page news, but Americans, their lives are on the, right on the front lines of fighting these kind of people, and most of us don't even give it a second thought. So war is a part of who we are. It has to be in this world. But let us always remember that we only fight wars, that in the end, there may be a lasting peace. These are the things that make us under God. Our compassion, our peacefulness, our generosity, and these are the things that we hope to change to become more like as citizens and as Christians. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Lord, as we gather before your altar on this Independence Day, we do offer prayers for our nation and for our leaders, 
We ask you, Lord, that they may be guided so that all that we may do as a country may be in accordance with your holy will. We ask your blessings to remain upon us always. We also pray for those who are traveling this 4th of July weekend. We pray for safe journeys for all of them. We also offer our prayers for Nellie Foster uh, on what would have been her 102nd birthday is offered by her son, Richard Foster, and family. We offer prayers at this time for Donnie Herzig, who passed away five years ago on this date, as offered by his wife Karen, and also loving family. We offer our prayers for Bernie Yedchich, as offered by his aunt Agnes. We also continue to offer prayers for Richard Slawenway, um, as he is undergoing chemotherapy for cancer, as offered by Marianne Foster. We offer still prayers for Lynch Richmond, uh, battling cancer and raising three young girls on her own. Alex, uh, who is battling lymphoma Hodgkin's disease, and Alicia, a young mother of three with stage four breast cancer, is offered by Cindy Benjamin. And we also continue to offer prayers for Jack Slay, also is offered by Marianna Foster. Are there any other prayers at this time you'd like to offer from the congregation? Well, you guys are getting chicken. Okay, all right. For all the private prayers, Lord, that we keep to ourselves, and also, Lord, we ask you to bless each and every one of us here gathered, to bless all those who are perish or are unable to be with us here today, and those who are perish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven.
We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be accepted to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Lord our God, into your hands we commend this day. We also commend our gifts, ourselves, and all of humanity. May we who live in the new life of Christ prefer no one and nothing over you. May we care for others as you care for all people. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Forever and ever. Consecrate myself for their sakes now that they may be consecrated in truth. 
that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be made complete. Father, all those you gave me I would have in my company, where I am to see this glory of mine, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. I myself am the bread of life. No one who comes to me shall ever be hungry. No one who believes in me shall ever thirst. After these and other words of the archpriest of prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which is given for you. taking this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hand. Again he gave thanks to you, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me.
past, present, and future, and by the intercession of the blessed and glorious Mother of God, Mary, together your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, as also Andrew and all the saints, grant us peace in our days, supported by the help of your mercy, that we all be free from sin and secure from all disturbance. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Shall I return to the Lord for all the graces that He has given me? I will take the chalice of salvation and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but I will say the word, and I shall be you.
justice and peace will kiss. The Lord be with you. Let us pray, Lord Jesus Christ, remove the barriers of sin among us who have been guests at your table. As we have received you, so let us receive the one who sent you and all others who are brothers and sisters in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Sacrifice which I, though unworthy, have offered the sight of your majesty be acceptable to you. Through your mercy may be effective for myself and all of those for whom I have offered it through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs>